Wir wollen uns heute Vormittag eben mit diesem regulatorischen Umfeld befassen. Deswegen freue ich mich auch, dass der Saal trotz allem oder vielleicht auch gerade deswegen nach wie vor voll ist. Wir wollen einfach mal tatsächlich darüber nachdenken, was ist eigentlich gute Regulierung, denn dass gute Regulierung wichtig ist, das wird niemand ernsthaft bestreiten wollen. Wie schwierig das ist, das haben wir heute Morgen von Herrn Färber schon stellenweise gehört. Es müssen verbindliche Rechtsrahmen geschaffen werden, in denen wir uns insgesamt bewegen und alle Marktteilnehmer auch sicher fühlen. Die Frage ist halt eben nur immer, was ist denn gute und was ist eigentlich schlechte Regulierung, wo ist es zu viel des Guten und wo vielleicht doch etwas zu wenig. Und eine weitere Frage, die sicherlich viele Fachleute besonders interessiert ist, die, ob in der globalisierten Welt, in der wir leben, eigentlich die Regulierung tatsächlich auch globalisiert werden kann und muss und wie das bitteschön in dieser komplexer werdenden Welt, in diesem Umfeld umsetzbar sein soll. Fest steht, dass es sich dabei um keine leichte Aufgabe handelt und dass es sehr lange dauern wird, mit ziemlicher Sicherheit sogar so lange, dass die Regulierung dem gesellschaftlichen Wandel und Prozess weit hinterherhinken dürfte. Was also ist denn nun gute Regulierung? Antworten dazu erhoffen wir uns nun von einem Vertreter der IOSCO, also der Internationalen Organisation der Wertpapieraufsichtsbehörden. Dazu ist extra, ich hätte jetzt fast gesagt, aus Holland wäre fast richtig, aber letzte Woche weiß ich, war er noch in Rio, also auch nicht so schlecht, aber ein weiter Weg zur Anreise. Der Head of Research, Werner Wiekerk, zu uns gekommen zum Derivatetag und um Ihnen vielleicht ein Kleines, einen kleinen Einblick darin zu gewähren, was der Mann eigentlich schon gemacht hat. Der war zunächst mal sieben Jahre bei der holländischen Wertpapieraufsicht AFM. Da gewinnt man, glaube ich, schon eine Menge Eindrücke. Seit sechs Jahren ist er nun bei der IOSCO und interessanterweise, und das fand ich ganz spannend, hat er seinerzeit den Steven Major, also den Chef der ESMA, ein bisschen fit gemacht in diesem regulatorischen Umfeld. Und daran sieht man, glaube ich, schon, dass der Mann weiß, wovon er redet. Und deswegen freue ich mich insbesondere auf seinen Vortrag. Werner, your turn. Thank you very much. I'm going to speak in uh, English because it's 25 years ago that I spoke my last German at school. But um, however, I understand it today, um, all the things you're talking about, so I'm very happy um, to hear with you. And indeed, um, last week, I was in Rio with one of your um, representatives, Christian Volmuth, and we were complaining about um, the fact that we were in Rio, um, not having had one single caipirinha and not having seen the beach. Although the hotel was in front of the beach, both we have been um, a little bit busy making presentations to about 650, 700 representatives from the regulatory community, from the markets, from the IMF, World Bank, OECD. So um, that was a big happening. And we kind of in a jet lag arriving here in Frankfurt and uh, trying to survive, trying to survive within this um, specialized crowd. Um, what I will do today is um, give you a few aspects, um, I think a few considerations we as regulators um, ought to use when we think of regulation, when we think of ourselves, but also trying to give you a view that you might have about us regulators, um, how we approach you as a community um, and how we interact. And I will finalize with a few words on my, let's say, day job, where I have to analyze potential systemic risks upcoming in the securities markets. And um, I'll give you the few of the latest risks we, um, we have um, analyzed in our report that has been published last week. Um, starting with that, I'm going to look. I have a disclaimer, as all good regulators have. This is my views and my own, my own and personal views. So um, nobody of our membership can be bound by them. Um, four themes today. Why does regulation matter? How does society see us, regulators? How do regulators approach you, market participants? And then a little bit about IOSCO, and I will start a little bit explaining what IOSCO is. We are an organization of 120 um, members, 120 regulators around the world are a member of IOSCO, and they oblige themselves to adopt the standards, the global standards we develop on all type of um, activity in the securities markets. Apart from um, the 120 members, we also have organizations like the DDVAO, like other kind of groupings of the industry with a sincere interest in 
um, fair and efficient markets and investor protection. So at the annual conference, for example, those groups mix together into the affiliate membership consultative committee, where your representative is um, kind of explaining your viewpoints to the regulatory community and interacts directly with um, the 120 regulators. It's quite an important um, forum, I would say, uh, to be heard at a global level. And since markets um, are growing globally more and more, I think it is very important to have this kind of dialogue um, on a more sustainable basis um, and to get also the viewpoints of such an important country um, as Germany into um, our field. Let's go to um, why does regulation at all matter? Well, we all know this from the early and the mid-90s and mid-2000s where um, the former chair of the NASDAQ was taken into uh, court and on the, left, on the right hand side you see Martha Stewart. Um, she was kind of a guru on, um, on the markets but um, used her knowledge, um, benefited from the knowledge by doing manipulation of prices. So it's about illegal and harmful, those terms you will, will get through the entire presentation, illegal and harmful activities um, to society. And of course this is one of the things um, that I kind of brought to the Dutch market. I investigated a type of product, um, an insurance product, unit linked, which brought it to a national scandal um, where investors were ripped off in a um, intransparent in way. Kind of each euro that was invested in, this, in these products, on average 40 cents leaked away in costs and all the kind of things. So this caused um, a big scandal with billions of uh, repayment. And at the time, this product was only very, very slightly regulated. Let's say 90% of the product wasn't. So therefore, um, we as regulators do exist in the world, and we have to help to get the markets fair and efficient. Um, stakeholders, we all know them. We all are stakeholders, sometimes in, 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 various, um, um, in various forms. Firms um, want regulation and they want to get capital at low cost. And for them, it's very important not to be blamed and to have a good standard in regulation. The reputation is, is very important there. Um, the participants, um, they need regulation to ensure a good level playing field and to have an insurance that the regulator um, catches the illegal players. And then the investors, of course, they need to understand the products they buy and they need to have good products. The state um, is here for the execution of laws. They want to put some order in the, um, in the state. And of course, um, regulators should not pass the budget. It should not be too expensive um, to have <coughs> regulators. And as regulators, why do we work in a regulator? And why don't we work in a market where we can get maybe a better salary? Well. Um, some of us think that we get some social esteem from our work. Um, before the financial crisis, that wasn't really the case. When you went to party, and you went to party with friends, and you know, in a law firm, and in a bank, and they were looking at you, poor regulator. He's going by bike. He's having a small apartment. Poor boy. And then, right after the crisis, that kind of turned around. You didn't want to say you were a banker. A banker? No. Well, you said, well, I'm a regulator. Oh, you are a regulator. Good. That's now kind of changing again a little bit. <laughs> I think, you know, the crisis has faded out, so our social esteem as regulators goes down. People start to talk about over-regulation, about too many rules, too detailed, getting into our business too much, costs, no economic growth. So it's an interesting thing, but it's an aspect that, uh, that you have to take into account when you talk to regulators and understand um, you know, they're live, why are they in public service, so to speak. And the press, of course, we know the press likes us when there are scandals, but also they likes us when nothing goes on and the regulator sleeps and scandal after scandal passes on. So we're an interesting um, object for um, the journalists. And in the end, we have to take um, in, into account that good regulation, smart regulation, means a good economy means capital formation, means efficient markets, and a flow between investment, um, sorry, savings and investment. So this is something uh, we all need to keep into, into mind. Now, how does society, industry, sees us regulators? 
Well, if you read the newspapers, we are the watchdogs of the markets. And sometimes we are the lapdogs of the markets. We sleep well while all the bad things, when all the bad things are happening. And then we all know this regulator, right? You know them? Pierluigi Colina. Pierluigi Colina is, um, today, he is a financial advisor. But at this time, when he was in, uh, in, in the football, he, is, uh, he was a referee, quite well known and quite well respected. And this kind of picture tells you a lot about the regulator itself. Because this man is not the most beautiful man in the world. He's not good enough for the market job. That's what we as regulators sometimes hear from you guys from the market. Technically, you don't understand our products. You don't understand our processes. That's a bit us. But we are the referees. That's why we use our hands sometimes. And that is a little bit of authority. This man had a lot of authority. And why is that? This is a lecture, a lecture I give a lot of times. Stephen Mayor had one. I don't know if he has learned a lot, but uh, you can tell that better than I do. But this is about, do I really know the play? Do I really know the game? And this man had a library of thousands of tapes of all players in the leagues he was refereeing. Thousands of tapes. And he studied each player one by one so that he knew what the player would be doing in the field in different circumstances. And that's why this man had so much authority. He would already know that somebody would react to an action in some ways. And that is, I think, the lesson a good regulator should take. A good regulator should know the marketplace, should know the products, and should know the people, so that the yellow and the red cards are less needed. So that you have a fluent kind of market where there is understanding on both sides. The market is not the enemy, the regulator is not the enemy. You should talk, you should understand, there should be that dialogue, and there should be that knowledge. And if that doesn't happen, the market sees it like the sniper. You walk around with your product and suddenly you get hit in the back. Poor market, poor product. You don't want to happen. So as a market participant, you also have to go to the regulator and educate him. Explain your product proactively. Very important. And then, if that all happens well, regulators become like the old. Knowing everything. Wise man you can consult. Even before you go out with a new innovative structure, product, activity. This is quite an ideal um, um, situation. We had one man, Hans Hugerfors, he's now the chair of the uh, IFRS Foundation the standard setter for the accounting um, world. And he believes strongly in that, that regulators should become old. Maybe we get there one day. And if not, and that's, I think, a picture you all can kind of recognize, the regulator stops your car from time to time and says, well, I'm going to check your books. Let me see what's going on. And maybe the modern regulator will look like this. Cameras everywhere. Your phone has been taped. Your computer is checked, your emails. And sometimes, yes, we've done that. I've done that in my AFM time with one big firm. We checked emails of a certain group of people because we expected, we are worried about certain activities. And indeed, we got a lot of bad behavior through um, looking over the shoulder in a secret way. Anyway, these were the images we as regulators kind of um, feel confronted with. And as regulators, you have to make your way through, through, the, through the images and try to form your own way of, shall I say, operations. And the operations is um, kind of the part of the next, um, of the next um, chapter here. When a, a regulator approaches you as, as the market, you have to Keep in mind that we are a bit confused and we see a lot of things, but we also have a framework in our minds that we use. We use for our investigations, our regulatory and supervisory focus. And what I put here is that we broadly can kind of make a, a, a difference between illegal behavior and harmful behavior. There are regulators in the world that take the law as the basis and only the law and go out and look for illegal behavior. And that can go so far and so detailed. 
that they look at very small kind of errors in your leaflets, in your prospectuses, and you get a fine, or you get an action against you. And then you have regulators who don't care about that small paperwork that might not be harmful. They look after the big things. They say, well, derivative managers, derivative producers in this, um, structured product producers in this, uh, in this country, you might have too many fees in your products. Your products might not suit the market in an efficient way. And then there is no legislation that tells the regulator to do so. But there is common sense. And then you enter into a dialogue, and that can end somewhere with new regulation or with self-regulation, and the market can take actions to open up, to make the things transparent, and to move on. As a regulator, you're always kind of in between these two extremes. And if you go too far to the harmful behavior that has not been regulated or is not written in law, you don't have a law to sustain your base, to have a basis um, for your actions. So it helps you in fixing the big problems, but it's very hard to make the, make the big problems um, kind of changing and mitigate them. And if you go too far to the illegal behavior, the market doesn't believe you anymore and think you're only focusing on those small things, right? They don't matter. I had once in my, my uh, career as a regulator at the AFM, a big bank would have been fired, uh, fined on, there was a name that I had on the sheet that was on the left-hand side corner, and it was put at the right-hand side. It was, that was the thing that was wrong. And there was a fine to come up of 5,000 euros or, I don't know, 50,000 euros because of that. Internally, at the regulator, we made a fuss about it, said, you can't do that. This is not serious. Yes, it's in the law, it's prescribed, it's rules-based, but it doesn't harm anybody. You better focus on bad behavior. So that's an interesting thing. And when you approach the regulator, or the regulator approaches you, you should see this in their mind. Where is the regulator? On which side is he? And try to get a good dialogue, because good regulation is important. So I'm jumping to um, some instruments um, you kind of feel, I think, from day to day in your job from the regulator. And that is the balance between rules and principles. Sometimes, in some um, um, instances, rules can be very important and needed, very strict rules, very descriptive rules, very detailed rules. They help you with immediate compliance because the thing is very clear, so people can start from the day after the implementation of the rule straight forward with, um, with the follow-up. It helps you also um, in your defense in litigation because the law makes crystal clear what is expected from you and, what you, and how you should regulate. It helps you also explaining internally in the regulator um, the sense of mission. This is how it goes. Internal cohesion, it's, it's consistent. Um, it prevents you of regulatory capture. A lot of regulators are extremely afraid of being captured by the industry. Industry comes, talks to you. You don't have enough technical knowledge, so you accept the standpoint of the, of the regulator, of the industry, and you are too soft in your, in your measures. It's one of the things that's in the mind of the regulator always. But if you have strict rules, there is no discussion. There is no discussion. Very simple for the regulator, very comfortable. And then it punishes the benefits by competitive advantages of people that do not comply. Rules are there for everybody, strict rules, so you have to comply. And indeed, if you have um, um, strict and detailed rules, there is a scale effect. The scale effect, if you have a number of products, everybody behaves the same, comparability is perfect. So that is a big, big scale effect. Then, in certain circumstances, principles might better work. If comparability if not, is not a problem, if um, there is not a huge number of people using the set of rules in a similar way, you can use principles. And principles have a lot of benefits, and I think a lot of market participants um, many times prefer them above rules. And that is indeed because it focuses more on the bigger things. It leaves a flexibility um, to the market participants on how to implement a rule. So if you say, for example, 
um, you should um, handle in the benefit of the client. It doesn't tell you how. So it gives you the freedom to implement it in your way. You don't have to change the systems. You don't have to change the compliance. You can just do what you already did, maybe tweak it a little bit, but that's the benefit of, of a principles-based approach. And indeed, it reaches further with fewer resources as a regulator and as a market participant. You don't need to have an army of people controlling the long list of rules that are involved with this principle. You can just rely on the good talk you have and then maybe as a regulator you take some tests into a firm um, but many times the outcome is clear, clear enough. And then again in the longer run if you have a flexible approach, if you have a principles based approach, um, principles kind of do not, um, what shall I say, um, they don't get older, they can survive waves of innovation and also waves in, let's say, stricter regulation and less strict regulation. So principles in, in general are helpful if you want to have a stable, long-run, stable and innovative market. That is a little bit, that was a little bit the concept you should keep in mind um, why regulators behave in some ways and why they approach you in certain ways. What I do now is go a little bit into IOSCO's role and a bit my day-to-day my -day role so that you have a better idea where um, your representative, the DDVAU, is, is kind of um, bringing his voice to. What we try to do is, at a global level, in our global markets, to protect investors, to ensure that markets are fair and efficient, and to reduce systemic risk. And that, lot, that last one is relatively new. Securities market regulators before the crisis did not used to look at systemic risk at all. They were just protecting investors on the one hand, fair and efficient markets on the other hand. We've seen in the crisis that a lot of the products and a lot of product structures were created in securities markets. So we thought we better have to look at that as well. And my day job is indeed looking into systemic risk. I ask our members what they do. We cooperate, develop, implement, and promote adherence to international recognized and consistent standards of regulation, oversight, and enforcement in order to protect investors, maintain fair and efficient and transparent markets, and seek to address systemic risk. Um, that is quite a thing. We have a structure where we develop the principles, we oblige ourselves as regulators to implement them locally, and there is a kind of system, a, mechani a mechanistic, that controls the implementation. We have an assessment committee that assesses country by country and rule by rule the implementation, but also time after time the IMF and World Bank um, drop by in the countries and um, check the regulatory system and check the level of implementation vis-a-vis -vis the rules of IOSCO. And these reports are public, and um, they lead to quite a bit of discussion about um, the level of implementation. So you don't want, as a regulator, not to implement it um, fully because you get quite some criticism by the IMF, um, et cetera, et cetera. And also, the FSB does a similar thing, and if it picks up that you haven't implemented some rules of IOSCO, some principles, um, you get from the G20 directly an assignment to do so. That's not a nice and interesting thing. The second thing which is important um, is that IOSCO um, operates a memorandum of understanding where we um, kind of couple together all the members that have signed up to it, and it facilitates the exchange of information in the case of transnational um, financial crime. And that means manipulation of prices, that means insider trading, that means fraud, and regulators are able to exchange very secret information among them. Even Switzerland, for example, um, has signed up, which means that the Swiss authorities um, exchange banking um, information on um, suspect people and firms to all other countries um, that have signed up to the system. And that is a system that, um, that helps fighting crime at a global scale. While we are growing as a global community. We hope that this type of powers develop um, um, along the lines and develop into a more 
what shall, what shall I say, legally binding system where we can set um, resolutions or dispute resolution settlement and do some more maybe um, global um, enforcement of um, our standards and laws. It looks like in a picture like this, IOSCO is here at, uh, at, uh, at the left-hand side. We make the standards um, um, for the securities market regulation. The other standard set is the Basel Committee, the IAIS and the uh, CPSS or CPMI, together with the IMF, World Bank and FSB. We all do our work in our segments and we bring that up to the G20 leadership um, Recently, they um, got together two weeks ago in Cairns in Australia, and um, one of the papers we produced was on long-term finance. We brought some innovative ideas to them, was in, indeed taken, and taken into account and endorsed by the G20. So this is about the structure we operate at the global level. Internally, uh, our process is first identify um, the big risks. This is my job. And then um, on those big risks, we try to develop global policies. And after the development of global policies, of course, the implementation phase is crucial, a three-step um, approach. So my research, what it does, um, it tries to signal timely big risks. Timely means ahead of the curve, so that you have time for a solution. We suggest solutions to um, the mitigation of those risks, and we try to focus IOSCO more on um, the big risks rather than on the detail and small things um, with our research. And I'll leave you with um, this picture. These are the main five risks we um, identified and analyzed into some depth in our securities market risk outlook where we have focused on the return of leverage and complexity in the markets. That's all on the wave of liquidity and search for yield and that is currently felt in securities markets, all done to help the economy um, grow again. Central banks, but leverage is everywhere in all type of products, in all type of structures, and it's not always a simple leverage. It's also some uh, unlinear um, 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 leverages some complex and very transparent products are back. The securitized, securitized products, for example, sounds like CDO squared. Yes, that is true. They are back. Um, that worries us at the moment quite a bit. Um, again, capital market volatility is an important one. Also, um, we've seen that with the tapering announcement last year that emerging markets have suffered quite a bit. And we uh, are looking into that. How um, the emerging market can um, become stronger um, and can withstand this type of um, sudden outflows of capital. The third um, risk we have identified is with regards to the CCPs, the central clearing parties. You might be all aware of that, that these central clearing parties are growing very fast, thanks to regulation, to channel risks from the banking sector into these um, vehicles, the CCPs, and they become so big that they are too important to fail at the moment. And in this interestingly benign volatile volatility environment, very low volatility, these vehicles have not been tested in a very, what should I say, volatile env environment. So we're quite worried about how they manage their risks and whether the risk models are all well tested and, and solid enough to withstand um, a round of margin calls due to something that happens in the markets. The fourth one is um, with regards to the use of collateral. Collateral is being used in many different ways um, to help funding, to help funding the banking system. Um, again, we have a very benign environment on volatility and we do not know what will happen to the positions of collateral if volatility jumps up. Parts of um, collateral comes, comes out of the banks and thanks to um, collateral transformation. Collateral with a low quality goes into a bank and gets out from, um, at a high quality. There is a transformation process there. It's very hard to see where the risks go and where the risks kind of pull. 
and it is extremely transparent to us. So in, until we have the figures there, um, we will not sleep um, quietly in Madrid, where IOSCO is based. And finally, we thought we had had all the crises um, in 2007, 2008, but we have seen a long list of scandals, Uriba, Liba, but then also the FX scandal, and that tells us that the governance of the firms is still not at the level where it should be, despite of the rules. A lot of countries have new rules on governance, very fine, maybe ex extremely well implemented. But these scandals tell us that the governance should be beefed up within the firms and to, 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 to guarantee or ensure, I think, a better um, and a more stable environment that we have seen. With these risks, I will leave you. I'm happy to take any questions, either now or in the in time after this meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> well, no, thank you very much uh, for Welcome. the speech. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, thanks. You talked a lot about harmonization and that you're sort of the global organization to coordinate regulators. Can you comment a little bit? Because what we are seeing from the industry point of view right now is basically that there's not a great deal of harmonization about how you look at things. You explained as well, you know, you have more the rules and principle view yep. and different things. But if you are, as a financial intermediary, active in different, uh, in different areas, then it becomes really difficult. No, it's, um, it's one of our, um, what shall I say, two, three biggest worries at the moment. One is um, the rise of systemic risk, and the second one is indeed um, the implementation of the rules. At a global level, it's very hard to get agreement on a single set of rules, and that is the high-level IOSCO principle. It's a long process. To get, um, to get an agreement on a harmonized rule. And once you have it, it's even more difficult to get it implemented in a way that, let's say, in, in a way that the timing, that's the first thing, the timing should be right. That is already extremely difficult. We've seen that in the derivative regulation um, around the globe as, as just an example. And then the level of granularity, get it implemented in a different um, parts in the world in a similar way so that global firms can operate under one single law, more or less. It's extremely difficult. And we have, um, and we still have a lot of internal fights and really fights um, among regulators because they all have a long tradition. We do it like this in the US. We do it like this in Japan. We do it like this in Germany and Europe. And not surprisingly, the industry is pushing, and I'm very happy that they do, because what we need is a level playing field at a global level in order to get efficient markets, to get the benefits of, really the benefits of, of global markets. So what we've done, we have created a task force that only looks at cross-border implementation. And that is a task force that's led by the SWIFT um, and Anne Eritier from, uh, from FINMA and Ashley Alder from Hong Kong to let's say, small players in the regulatory world. So it's not led by the US and, the, and Europe, for example. And they are already kind of, what shall I say, they have some clashes from time to time. So it's two smaller jurisdictions that kind of have the benefits and the costs from the regulations that come from, 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 from above. And I have to say, um, it will be a long process. There is no silver bullet, but it makes little steps, baby steps. It's good that the big countries, the big regulators, listen to smaller regulators and listen to the industry, to the needs of the industry. We all know regulation is needed, and that's fine. But let it be a regulation that is least, at least brings at less cost as possible to the industry. What you don't want is if you are a global bank and you are in 80 countries, that you have to have a single system, single appliance system in each of the countries. But we also have to recognize that in the near future, you can't expect um, a real global playing field. It will be a long, long process, but we have to go 
into that, uh, into that process. I think your voice is very important in the Wessel Ministry roundtables with this task force. And they, they brought a lot of, of good material um, um, to, the, um, you know, to the Bühne. I think that's the German word, isn't it? Um, so I would encourage you to, um, to participate in those, uh, in those also consultation processes, um, roundtables, but also a consultation paper will be, um, will be written very soon and published very soon on that. Some more question? Nicht der Fall? Dann gerne in der Mittagspause. Werner, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Good evening.